Rob Bonnet. Thousands of Kosovo Albanians greet Tony Blair with cheers and applause. He tells the crowd, your courage inspired us and gave us hope. A spacecraft crashes into the moon to try to find evidence of water. And the hottest day of the year brings the highest levels of air pollution. Good evening. Tony Blair has told thousands of Kosovo Albanians that their courage in the conflict had inspired NATO. The crowds in Kosovo's capital, Pristina, cheered and chanted his name as he said he was proud to see them back in their homeland where they belong. He called on all ethnic communities to put their bitter conflicts behind them. It was a hero's welcome for the Prime Minister, nothing less. This was the first of many embraces. Kosovo Albanians see Mr. Blair as the NATO leader who fought longest and hardest on their behalf. There was real emotion here today. This elderly man hugged him like a brother and didn't want to let go. But it wasn't all joy and celebrations. The Prime Minister has come to a Kosovo with an uncertain future. Ethnic Albanians are enjoying new freedom, but many Serbs here are living in fear. During his visit, he's pleading for tolerance. <laughs> to the crowd waiting to see and hear him, the message was no more hate, no more killing. We want all people here in Kosovo, whether Albanians, whether Serbs, whatever their background, to live in peace and security and friendship, one with another. As he spoke, army marksmen kept watch. Security was tight, so tight that many in Pristina didn't know the Prime Minister was here. But from those who did, there was a great deal of gratitude. And we thank him, uh, he is our best friend, I mean, for all the customers here in Kosovo. His brief visit at an end, the Prime Minister said an emotional farewell. I look forward to the day when I come here again, when Pristina is rebuilt, when Kosovo is rebuilt, and when all people here live in justice and partnership and friendship for the future. Thank you. That kind of future may be a long time coming, but today the people of Kosovo felt once again they were not alone. Orlegiran, BBC News, Pristina. And the first British troops to enter Kosovo after the end of the conflict have arrived back in Britain. Around 100 members of the 1st Battalion Parachute Regiment were reunited with their families at RAF Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire. They were the first to enter Kosovo after the end of the conflict, and they're the first frontline troops to come home. Come on, Jen. It's always last. Oh, you for them and those they left behind, it's been a long and sometimes agonizing two months. I'm with you. Desperately missed at home, but desperately needed in Kosovo. It was like a liberation day again, flowers, young ones like this running up to you and holding your legs, not letting you go. It was very emotional. Women running up to you, not being able to not being able to speak. After the horrors they've seen, all of them were holding their families even closer today. The Paras spearheaded the NATO move into the province, patrolling the streets of the capital, Pristina, trying to restore order and rebuild shattered communities. We arrived in a city that was largely lawless. There were a lot of very ghastly murders, lootings, arson attacks and so on. And through our presence on the streets, by getting out and patrolling with our interpreters and talking to people, reassuring people, we have reduced that level of violence. Kosovo is far safer now than when the Paras first arrived, but they finished only the first stage in an operation that may well involve British troops for years. All the remaining Paras will be home by tomorrow night, but they leave behind more than 9,000 British troops on peacekeeping duties in the former Yugoslavia. Philippa Young, BBC News, RAF, Bryce Norton. A space probe has ended its mission by crashing, as planned, into the moon. The lunar prospector has been circling the moon for 18 months, during which it detected evidence that ice might be trapped at the lunar poles. Scientists at the American space agency NASA are confident that the probe hit the crater, 
but early results haven't been encouraging. The Lunar Prospector was launched 18 months ago and has since been carrying out a survey of the Moon's surface. NASA decided to end its mission by crash landing it in a part of a lunar crater always in darkness and therefore likely to be the most promising site to contain ice. The hope was that a plume of vapor would arise from the crash site containing perhaps enough water as would fill a bath. This could then be detected. I think if we find water, we then have to go and see how much and what state it's in um, so that we could actually use it as, as a living off the land thing. But I think it would be an important first step toward getting people back in the loop on the moon and, and actually maybe, uh, maybe having outposts. However, telescopes watching the moon from Earth have so far seen nothing, and one scientist said it was a bit of a disappointment. This does not necessarily mean that there is no water, since further analysis by ultraviolet light will be made, and this could take some time. The presence of water with its oxygen and hydrogen could mean that one day human beings will be able to survive on the moon instead of just visiting. Paul Reynolds, BBC News, Washington. 34 people have been arrested at a Lincolnshire farm, which is one of the site of one of the largest trials of genetically modified crops in the country. The arrests for criminal damage took place after protesters started to tear up May's Bar Farm. But the farmer says they missed the GM site and instead attacked the one next door, destroying the crop he would have fed to his cattle this winter. Immigration officers have warned the government that thousands of immigrants are entering Britain illegally on Eurostar trains. They've been avoiding passport checks in France by exploiting a loophole and buying a train ticket to Calais and another to London. Immigration officers at the French border assume they've already had their passport checked. The government says it may fine Eurostar £2,000 for every illegal immigrant it brings into Britain. Smog warnings have been issued on the hottest weekend of the year so far. Asthma sufferers in particular have been told that high levels of pollution could significantly affect their breathing. The high temperatures have also led to congestion on many roads. For those who've come to believe the phrase British summer is a contradiction in terms, the current hot spell has been welcomed like a long-lost friend. Today, Brighton Beach was just one of the destinations for the sun worshippers. By mid-afternoon, temperatures in some parts were touching 31 degrees centigrade, 88 degrees Fahrenheit. But while these temperatures may be good for the soul, whether they're so good for our health is another matter entirely, because the British love for the sun is matched by a love for the motor car, and on a day like today, the combination can cause problems. And with traffic on many roads, such as the M5 in the West Country, bumper to bumper for much of the day, the resulting exhaust fumes and the lack of any wind to disperse them caused high pollution levels. Breathe in nice and deep. The Department of the Environment is warning okay. that asthmatics should take particular care. Doctors' surgeries are anticipating a busy few days. If they have a respiratory condition like asthma, they may find that their symptoms are getting worse. And that'll be that they'll be getting more cough or wheezing, sometimes breathlessness. They can find it difficult to sleep and they may find that they're using their inhalers a lot more. With similar temperatures expected tomorrow, everyone is being urged to keep out of the sun during the hottest part of the day and to drink plenty of fluids. Many will be returning to the beaches and parks in the morning, but for those for whom the hot spell is causing misery, relief is in sight, with the weather expected to break in the middle of next week. John Brain, BBC News. Now, with news of the first day of the Scottish football season and the rest of the sport, here's Rob Bonnet. Yes, treble holders Rangers made a winning start to the new Scottish Premier League season this afternoon. Though their performance against Kilmarnock at Ibrox was far from emphatic. Rod Wallace got the opening goal in their 2-1 victory. American Claudio Reyna scored the winner. Elsewhere, a Willie Faulkner goal for Dundee in the Tayside derby failed to stop Dundee United taking the points late in the game through Portuguese substitute Jacques Ferraz. A former Scottish international Pat Nevin scored one of the goals in Motherwell's 2-all draw at Hibernian. And Gary McSwiggan helped Hearts to the biggest win of the day. That was 4-1 at St Johnston. A record equaling 12 under par round of 60 has lifted Northern Ireland's Darren Clark into the lead of the Smurfit European Open at the K Club near Dublin. After two rounds, he's two shots clear of Japan's Katsuyoshi Tomori and three ahead of the Englishman David Guilford and Lee Westwood. 
for second right in the middle. Having gone round yesterday in a very ordinary 73, Darren Clark needed to pull his socks up just to make the final two days of this tournament. What he produced was an improvement that shot him from 87th position in the field to the top of the leaderboard, recording only the ninth score of 60 in the history of European Tour golf. He birdied 12 of the 18 holes, and in one purple patch broke par on eight consecutive holes. The putts just kept dropping. This, on the 15th of the day, took him into the lead for the first time. And it might have been even better. If this highly sinkable putt, three greens from home, had gone in, he'd have become the first ever player in Europe to score a 59. On a course as benign as Carnoustie a fortnight ago was hostile, scoring all round has been low. In his first tournament since winning the Open, Paul Laurie is well placed on six under par, a position he shares with Colin Montgomery. And Jean van der Velde seems to have got over his Carnoustie collapse, certainly not out of contention, a further three shots behind. Steve McCormack, BBC News. Now Formula One and Finland's Mika Hakkinen is in pole position for tomorrow's German Grand Prix at Hockenheim. The reigning world champion was five hundredths of a second quicker than Jordan's Heinz Harald Frensen with Hakkinen's McLaren teammate David Coulthard in third place. Ferrari's Eddie Irvine, who's two points behind Hakkinen in the Drivers' Championship, had a number of problems during qualification, but he'll start fifth with Damon Hill eighth. There were two more silver medals for Britain at the European Swing Championships in Istanbul today. Uh, James Hickman finished nearly four-tenths of a second behind Sweden's Lars Frölander in the 100 metres butterfly. And in the 4 by 200 metres freestyle, Paul Palmer collected his third medal of the week as the first leg of the relay team. Although Britain actually finished in fourth place, the first two teams home, that's Holland and Italy, were both disqualified for full starts, handing Germany the gold medal and Great Britain the silver. There was a thrilling finish to the Vodafone Nassau Stakes at Goodwood this afternoon, with seven horses separated by just over three lengths at the finish. Godolphin's Zarad Dubai won by half a length from Lady in Waiting, with Diamond White a head away in third place. Jim McGrath describes the closing stages. Zarat Dubai still in front of Lady in Waiting, and now Diamond White getting through along the inside from Kissagram. Zarat Dubai, though, still in front, and Zarat Dubai is going to win it. Zarat Dubai, photo second, Lady in Waiting, and Diamond White, then Kissagram. Afterwards, winning jockey Gary Stevens collected a two day ban for careless riding, though the result was allowed to stand. And defending world superbike champion Carl Fogarty is in pole position for tomorrow's Grand Prix at Brands Hatch. The Englishman is defending a 49-point lead in the championship. Sean. And tonight's main news again. Thousands of Kosovo Albanians have given Tony Blair a rapturous welcome in Pristina. He told them their courage was inspiring. That's it for now. The main news will be at 20 past 10 over on BBC One with Peter Sissons. Good evening. Good evening to you. We reached 31 degrees Celsius or 88 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest day so far this year. But warm enough also to trigger some storms, especially in the southeast of England, where we've seen some thunderstorms getting going really from lunchtime onwards and drifted a little bit further north as well. And still some showers around in the southeast of England and up in towards Cambridgeshire and Leicestershire. And sorry, some of those showers will probably be with us for this evening as well. Other areas dry and fine, a bit more cloud across parts of Scotland, here a few showers likely as well. And that's really how it ends up late in the day, still some hot sunshine to enjoy, but the sun weakening now. But it's going to be another hot day tomorrow, and also we're going to see more of those showers. Turning misty tonight, and very murky, especially along North Sea coast with that low cloud returning, and a warm sticky night to come as well, temperatures falling no lower than 16 to 18 in the southeast. Tomorrow we are going to see some of that mist and low cloud first thing in the morning. That'll move out the way, and certainly burn back to the coastal regions, and then we'll see more of those showers, and it will be hot again. Top temperatures 27 to 30. Bye for now.